All right, so let's finish up this lecture talking about acute decompensated heart failure and we'll quickly touch base on pulmonary hypertension. Uh, acute decompensated heart failure would really be the other side of the equation. So we spent a lot of time on Monday talking about chronic heart failure and chronic meds. And so this is the other side of the, the problem with heart failure. Uh, heart failure is a huge cause of hospitalizations and readmissions and has a, a massive uh, economic impact on on healthcare expenditures. So it's really important, I think, to understand the inpatient side of treatment. Um, obviously, not all of you will work in that area, so it might not be relevant to your ultimate practice, but I do think it's important to talk about it because if you do work in hospital care, no matter what hospital, small hospital, community hospital, large academic center, cardiac center or not, heart failure is really common across the board and it's gonna be a common presentation for admission. So if you do any type of hospital care, whether it's ED, or you work more in like a hospitalist model, internal medicine type model, you're going to come across heart failure admissions. Uh, so anyway, scope of the problem, some stats here that you can look through. Um, hospitalization, initial episode, 21%, repeat visit, 79%. Um, this is a big area of targeting readmissions for patients and trying to cut down on readmissions. Readmissions um, to hospitalization is a, is a big deal in general because oftentimes if you readmit within a certain number of days after discharging. So for example, let's say you discharge from the hospital after heart failure admission. Um, if you readmit within a certain amount of time frame, oftentimes the insurance companies won't pay for that hospitalization. They'll say, sorry, it was up to you guys to do a good enough job to get this patient the resources they need to not readmit to the hospital. And now that they have, we aren't gonna pay for it. So it's on you. And that's uh, across the board with a lot of different conditions, but heart failure is a big deal with that because it is such a huge cost burden if they readmit. And heart failure patients are so likely to readmit that it really needs to be a focus of care. Uh, we talked about this a little bit already with the neurohormonal hypothesis. Um, so really salt water retention, cardiac output, um, and the RAS system getting over-ramped. You get, um, we talked about sympathetic nervous system, so that's what this are here. We talked about some of this other stuff, brain natriuretic peptide, tumor necrosis factor alpha, nothing really uh, too significant from a pharmacologic aspect. So uh, just to review that quickly, I threw that in there. Um, acute decompensated heart failure, signs and symptoms are really going to be the same as, as regular heart failure, congestion, uh, but usually what happens is you get the congestion side of things getting so overwhelmed that it can start to affect how the heart works overall and you can end up with um, a p picture where you're just hypoperfusing and that can be fatal in some cases. So what happens is uh, we can measure a couple different things. So congestion and cardiac output are the two major um, areas that we try and look at for acute decompensated heart failure and also the areas we try and manage pharmacologically. So things that signs and symptoms of congestion, weight gain, dyspnea, um, other pulmonary features that, that would lead you to believe there's some pulmonary edema going on. Um, early satiety and ascites would mean fluid buildup in the abdomen and uh, hepatosplenomegaly or other things might be seen. Uh, lower cardiac output, fatigue, altered mental status, cold extremities, worsening renal function, hypotension, and hyponatremia. Now you can measure things like pulmonary capillary wedge pressure to see how uh, congested the person is. And you can also measure specific parameters to look at cardiac output and cardiac index. But overall, a lot of this is just driven by symptoms. So what I'm gonna talk about is a couple different models and I don't want you to get too caught up on the numbers I'm going to give you. I'm going to give you numbers of pulmonary capillary wedge pressure and uh, cardiac output, but overall it's all about symptomatic relief and symptomatic improvement. So you can, you can know if a patient, just for example, if a patient comes in and they've gained 12 pounds in the last day, two days, and they have really cold extremities and they have history of heart failure, and let's say, I'll just throw it out there, their serum creatinine is really high. That's pretty obvious they're congested because their weight gain and their cardiac output's not doing great. You don't really need specific lab parameters to measure that, right? So a lot of this is symptom driven and you don't have to, but I am going to give you, you don't have to know the numbers for the exam, but I am going to give you the numbers just uh, to, to be complete here. Uh, so we're gonna talk about four different subsets of acute heart failure, one, two, three, and four. And I think they're pretty straightforward as far as how you treat. And really the subset depends 
on what uh, is going to lead you down the pathway towards what drugs you're going to pick. Uh, so for example, a patient who's warm and dry, that means that they're perfusing and they aren't congested. That's a patient who doesn't need any management really. I mean, they still might have some symptoms. You can be warm and dry and still have maybe a little bit of pulmonary edema going on, but ultimately you might not need to do anything. So anyway, we'll kind of work down these algorithms. But again, um, I put the the index, uh, cardiac index, which is how you measure cardiac output, and pulmonary capillary wedge pressure on here just for the, for the sake of being complete. All right, so therapeutic options, we really have a couple things we can do. Diuretics, we already talked about those. Uh, that's an obvious choice for a congested patient. Inotropes um, can be used to improve contractility. We already talked about dobutamine a little bit, and we're going to talk about milrinone in some more detail today. Uh, vasodilators and natriuretic peptide can decrease preload and afterload. So these drugs can help um, with the acute symptomatic relief of uh, heart failure exacerbations. All right, let's talk about subset one. Warm and dry patient. This patient is perfusing. Oh, I, I picked cats for this. I don't know why. I, people make fun of me for this every year, <laughs> but I pick pictures of cats. So here's a nice cat, like in a dryer. I guess that's warm and dry. Um, <laughs> but you have a, a patient who is perfusing. They aren't fluid overload. Really, there's not a whole lot to do. Um, if they're in the hospital and they just maybe they're having something like dyspnea on, a, on exertion. But other than that, you can't really pin anything down. Maybe it's just optimize their medications. Maybe can they go up a little bit on their ACE? Can they go up a little bit on their beta blocker? Um, are they just slightly fluid overloaded? Um, that would be something maybe to optimize their diuretic. Are they too dry? It's possible a patient who's warm and dry might present to the hospital because they're actually overly dry. They've overdone their diuretic. And um, we might want to remove some fluid restrictions for them, um, give them IV fluids if you need to, and then we could see if, uh, if that improves anything. All right, subset two, warm and wet. Here we've got some, some guy showering with his cat. <laughs> and you have... A patient here who would be perfusing fine, but they're fluid overloaded, so to the point where they're obviously symptomatic and congested. The primary treatment here is going to be probably what you'd expect, IV diuretics. We're going to use Lasix or furosemide, bumetanide. Um, all the diuretics, all the loop diuretics come oral and IV. And with the exception of Lasix, like bumetanide and torsamide are one-to-one -one oral to IV. And uh, furosemide is about a two-to-one ratio, so that means that and it goes the opposite way. So like 40 milligrams of IV furosemide is about equivalent to 80 milligrams of oral furosemide. That's because furosemide doesn't have as good a bio bioavailability as the other two, which are pretty much almost completely absorbed from the GI tract. Furosemide's got really variable. It can be highly absorbed by some patients, but also like 50% absorption or even less other patients. It's, it's uh, not a, a given that it's going to all absorb when you take that dose. So we usually say it's about a 50% reduction from IV Lasix to, to oral Lasix. Uh, all right, IV vasodilators. Vasodilators can help uh, take the work off the heart and they can really promote some symptomatic relief and they act really fast. Most of the time, I'm just going to highlight this. We're going to talk about this in a second here in more detail. But IV nitroglycerin is going to be the, the drug of choice. Sodium nitroprusside is a bit more advanced, and the serotide uh, also would be very situational. These are both really, really expensive. Um, nitroglycerin is cheap, and it's easy to use, and it's almost always going to be the one you're going to give somebody. Uh, diuretics, I'll just say this. I don't think I mentioned this uh, earlier in this set of slides, but diuretics do take some time to work. So... If you need to get that fluid off fast, uh, even if you give somebody an IV dose of a diuretic, it's still going to probably take an hour uh, to see the full effects of that diuresis. Di you can't. It's not like you can, remember you're, you're working through the kidney, so it's not like you can just give somebody a diuretic and instantly get rid of fluid. It does take some time for that diuresis to occur. And IV gives us a head start where we can get it directly into systemic circulation. It's going to get rid of that oral absorption period that we'd have to wait for if we give somebody an oral dose. But at the end of the day, uh, it still might not be enough. So if somebody is heavily congested and they're symptomatic, you know, they're having respiratory issues, I would say is probably be the biggest sign of that. If they just have a lot of pitting edema and otherwise are looking okay, you might just be wait until the IV diuretic kicks on. If they're congested and heavily symptomatic, uh, specifically again with respiratory symptoms, you might try an IV vasodilator to relieve that. 
All right, so let's talk about vasodilators a little bit more. These are all intravenous medications, and they're given as continuous infusions, a.k.a. an IV drip. Um, so again, a wet, congested patient, we're going to use vasodilators on. Nitroglycerin, again, the most common one here. It forms the free radical nitric oxide, which is a natural vasodilator and causes smooth muscle relaxant. Mostly decreases preload, so you're decreasing that work on the heart, especially in a pulmonary edema situation. It's a really nice medication to give somebody that's going to work very quickly. It's going to help them breathe better, help increase their O2 sats and things like that, make them a lot more comfortable while you wait for that diuretic to kick in and remove fluid. Nitroprusside is a much more broad spectrum vasodilator. It's, it's a potent um, product that works both on the arterial and venous side, and so it'll decrease preload and afterload. It's got a lot more significant effect on blood pressure. So one thing about nitroglycerin is while it's a good vasodilator, it doesn't have a ton of um, hypotensive effects. I mean, it will lower the blood pressure somewhat, but it's not going to like tank their blood pressure completely unless the person's really unstable. Nitroprusside, on the other hand, will drop the blood pressure. Um, we actually use this as a drug for really hypertensive emergency type patients. So that's more where its goal is. And nasiratide, or Natricor, is a brain natriuretic peptide analog, and it binds to guanylyl cyclase receptor, which causes smooth muscle relaxation and, again, reduces that. Um, nasiratide is rarely ever used. I'm not going to test you on nasiratide. I don't want you to know anything about it, really, other than that it exists for the purpose of a, as a secondary vasodilator. Sometimes with people with really resistant uh, heart failure exacerbations, they'll use it, but it's not been shown to be all that beneficial in the long run, so we don't use it all that much, and it's pretty expensive. Again, nitroglycerin is quite cheap. Nitroprusside used to be relatively affordable, but some companies stopped making it. It's actually now like $2,000 a bag, which is very, very pricey, so we kind of avoid it if we can. All right, subset three, this is a cold and dry patient. This patient is hypoperfusing, but they aren't fluid overloaded. Uh, so this is going to require usually some sort of fluid uh, replacement. This patient I think of maybe as somebody who, an obvious picture for a heart failure patient would be somebody who overdid it on their diuretics and their um, dry and then at the same time that affects if your fluid down your heart doesn't have any volume to pump and that can cause increased damage uh, or problematic so you always need to replace fluids before you're going to do anything now i've done all these pulmonary capillary wedge pressure parameters here a lot of times what you're going to be looking at is the blood pressure however so pc WP, you can only get that measurement actually by using specific monitoring parameters. And if you're in like a small hospital or an ED or something, you just aren't going to have a PC, PCWP to work with. So anyway, um, if somebody, is, uh, somebody has dehydration status or they're under perfusing and they and you can tell it by their cold extremities or their symptoms. Um, you should be able to see on labs if, if what's happening. So you, like if the person has um, electrolyte imbalances or um, renal, imp it's impacting their renal function, that could be a sign that they have a um, hypoperfusing uh, a picture that is also dry. So anyway, give fluids. Uh, how much fluids? It doesn't really matter per se. I would give an, a solid bolus of fluids. You really have to make sure that you do fluids first because you need adequate filling pressures before you start an inotropic therapy. And then you're going to give inotropes. So there's two, three, well, I guess there's three inotropes we usually use, dopamine, dobutamine, and milrinone. So the big difference here, and I think I messed this up, yeah, sorry, I did my sign around here. You can change that. There we go. Um, if the MAP is less than 50, so the mean arterial pressure is less than 50, uh, dobutamine, or excuse me, dopamine is going to be given uh, because dopamine is a presser and it also is an inotrope. So it's going to cause an increase in um, the way that the heart beats and, and improve the, the strength of the heartbeat, but it's also going to cause systemic vascular resistance to improve, so you're going to up blood pressure. Um, this is usually a more severe picture when you've got somebody in this subset and they also have a really low MAP, um, then you definitely want pressors on board. And dopamine is a great choice because it, again, it helps the heart. This is almost like a, a, cardiovas a, a cardiovascular shock type picture. Um, if their blood pressure is okay, 
IV inotropes are still indicated, and um, dobutamine or milrinone would be preferred in this case. Dobutamine and milrinone mostly work just on the heart. They don't really have a lot of effects on blood pressure, so you won't get those um, changes in hemodynamics, which is good. You don't really want to change the blood pressure, increase the blood pressure really high if you don't have to. Um, no compelling reason for an inotrope. So this would be a picture of if the patient, let's say their MAP is greater than 50, um, but their systolic blood pressure isn't lower than 90. So let's say their systolic blood pressure is normal. Let's say their blood pressure is normal, but they're still symptomatic. Um, like maybe they have some worsening renal function, for example, like their electrolytes are off, their renal function looking like almost a kidney injury. Um, you might consider an IV vasodilator in that case. So it's all really guided. This subsets, besides the fluid bolus, is really guided based on blood pressure. So that's what I'll test you on, is um, I want you to know the MAP cutoffs for the different items we give. So if I give you a patient, I'll make them obviously cold and dry with symptoms in, in my case on the exam, and I'll give you a MAP that's clearly within one of these parameters, and I'll ask you what to do. So I'll give you, I'll say they're like systolic blood pressure, their MAP is, you know, 45, or their MAP is 55, their systolic blood pressure is 85 or, or something like that, and that should guide you towards which one to use. For inotropic therapy, um, just to talk about this in a little bit, remember this is for our hypoperfusing hypo patients. Dobutamine is uh, the, probably the most common one. It's a pure beta-1 agonist. It's got a positive inotrope and chronotrope effect. It has a short ha half-life, so you can titrate it relatively easily. Generally, it's designed for short-term use. So um, there are some studies to show that people have increased mortality for use over than 72 hours. But if you need dobutamine for more than 72 hours, you're, you're not in a good picture for your, <laughs> your overall health anyway. Uh, so that's a bit of a confounding variable. Sometimes you will see people on dobutamine chronically, actually, people who have heart failure um, who might go home on a chronic low um, low concentration presser infusion or um, dobutamine infusion or sorry i shouldn't say presser i should say inotrope infusion uh, and dobutamine infusion so that is something that's used long term for these patients sometimes but in the acute phase it, it should work well to get things under control while you get their fluid status back on board and then hopefully things will resolve on their own Milrinone is a second option. Milrinone is a phosphodiesterase 3 inhibitor, uh, another positive inotrope. It's a peripheral vasodilator as well, so it might drop blood pressure a little bit. Um, you has minimal chronotropic activity, so where dobutamine will also cause the heart rate to increase, milrinone usually will just cause it to beat harder. Um, it does have a longer half-life of an hour, so it's a little bit difficult to titrate from that perspective, but not a big barrier to use. Uh, one thing about milrinone that's a good advantage is your patient is already on a beta blocker. So let's say they come in with a heart failure exacerbation and they took their carvedilol dose that morning. Um, you can't really do anything to get rid of that carvedilol. So giving something that's a pure beta-1 agonist like dobutamine, you might be able to overcome some of that beta blockade on those receptors. But the odds are that it's going to be a lot of work to do that. So milrinone might be an advantage for those patients on beta blockers because it's got, uh, it, it works on a separate mechanism. So by inhibited, inhibiting a specific type of enzyme that causes a positive inotropic effect. Just something to keep in the back of your head. I do think that's probably the biggest difference as to where you'd use one over the other is um, if that patient has beta blockade on board, uh, depending on when they last took their beta blocker dose. And remember all heart failure patients probably will be on beta blockers. So that's a, a common complication that you might arrive at with this type of subset. All right, the final subset, the cold and wet. This is a patient who's not doing well at all, um, and it's very similar uh, to the first or to the third subset, I should say. So you have um, a MAP-directed drips, so dobutamine or dopamine, and then your inotrope, and it's again very similar. The reason being is because hypoperfusion is the biggest issue here. If you're hypoperfusing, you're at risk for end organ damage, and we really need to get that corrected right away. The difference between subset three and two and four, excuse me, is that um, your patient is fluid overloaded at this point. So you don't really have to worry about them not having enough volume for the heart to pump. You want to get that volume off eventually, but you really want to work on this stuff as fast as you can. OK, just some quick tips. Ensure patients are on optimal heart failure medications, uh, ACE inhibitors.
during an acute episode, use cautiously. Uh, if you're aggressively diuresing the person, you might want to hold their ACE inhibitor just to give the kidneys uh, plenty of chance to remove that fluid. You could cause renal damage if you accidentally overdo the diuretic. Um, but just, again, use some caution with that. For beta blockers, you don't dis discontinue on a patient who is stable prior to admission. So if somebody comes in with a you know, if you're using dobutamine, you might want, might want to consider stopping it. So there's situational reasons, but generally you can keep the beta blocker going. Um, I wouldn't initiate a new beta blocker therapy or titrate your dose up until that volume status is is um, stable. That way you don't have to worry about the heart not being able to pump with enough volume in it. You always hold the beta blocker if somebody's hemodynamically unstable too. So that one really, so I said the dobutamine example, well, yeah, situationally, you just stop that. So anyway, anyways, somebody with like a subset one or two, you could probably keep the beta blocker on board. Subset three or four, you're going to hold it. Digoxin, avoid discontinuing unless you have a compelling reason. So if they have dig toxicity and you can get a level fairly quickly to see, you would stop it. Um, otherwise, digoxin withdrawal associated with worsening heart failure symptoms um, is, is something that can happen. So if you stop the dig cold turkey, usually digoxin doesn't have any really confounding effects with these symptoms. So you can keep it running with, with minimal impact on the patient. Now, one thing to remember is digoxin is renally eliminated. So if that patient is going into an acute kidney injury, that's a risk of accumulating and toxicity, uh, of occurring. So make sure that that's something you think about when, um, if you're admitting a patient and they are on digoxin, how's their renal function doing? Um, it might not be your job if you're working in the ER or something, but if you're working as a hospitalist, it definitely will be something to monitor and to check levels on and make sure they aren't getting toxic or empirically dose reduced. And you can talk to a pharmacist about that. Okay, uh, just a couple slides on pulmonary hypertension. Pulmonary hypertension is pretty rare. And unless you work in a major cardiac center, you probably won't see it. And like even, even at Abbott, which is a huge cardiac place, we don't do a lot of pulmonary hypertension. The University of Minnesota actually is, is the big center around here that manages pulmonary hypertension patients. And it really depends, I think, on the cardiologists that practice in this area and the specialists. So where they go, for example, we had a, we had a big pulmonary special, pulmonary hypertension specialist at Abbott for several years. And then when we went live on our, on our electronic electron, oh, electronic electronic, um, electronic medical record system, Epic, apparently, this is a rumor I heard, but he wasn't happy with the way that was rolled out. So he actually went to the U and then they rolled theirs out later. So he probably got the same junk later. <laughs> I don't know if he's trying to avoid EMRs or what, but anyway, we lost our, our, our pulmonary hypertension specialist and we really haven't regained that population back. Again, it's relatively rare disease. So you don't see it commonly enough to have need for multiple major centers and cities to support this. Certainly we get pulmonary hypertension patients here and there, and you'll see it in the hospital, but it is a, a pretty rare illness. I do think it's interesting though, so I want to talk about it somewhat. Um, you'll hear it referred to as PAH or pulmonary arterial hypertension, also known as primary or familial. That's idiopathic. There's no real known cause for this type, and this is one of the more common presentations of pulmonary hypertension. It can affect younger people too. Again, not really a direct cause uh, of, of it. Um, some secondary causes thought to exist I've put down here. Uh, there's some other things on here, like there's some cancers that are thought to maybe um, promote pulmonary hypertension, but no one really knows exactly what brings it on. Symptoms are very similar to standard chest pain, or chest pain, standard heart failure, um, dyspnea and exertion, fatigue, syncope, weakness, uh, chest pain, impaired oxygen delivery to tissue, diminished cardiac output. It's very similar to heart failure. It's just a different pathophysiology. Um, diagnostics, elevated mean pulmonary arterial, arterial pressure is uh, going to be high in these patients, a so normal 9 to 18. These patients are going to be above 25 uh, with a low pulmonary capillary wedge pressure. Right ventricular hypertrophy, uh, right ventricular pulmonary arterial enlargement, um, cool cyanotic extremities, hepatomegaly is common, peripheral edema, ascites. Uh, so we want to reduce acute dyspnea symptoms. We want to improve exercise capacity, quality of light, and also prevent death. People who are diagnosed with pulmonary hypertension, if it progresses without treatment, it's fatal within a couple of years. Uh, so it's really important that you manage these patients pretty aggressively right off the get-go. Um, these are the WHO functional classes. Sorry for this old slide. It looks really dated now. Um, I think I just took this from Google, so forgive me. Uh, but it's it's similar to how the heart failure is classified. You know, the higher the class, you get more symptoms. That's a higher significance in emergency there.
Um, initial therapy with pulmonary hypertension approved drugs according to the functional class. So this is the fifth symposium. This was relatively recently came out within the 2013 guidelines uh, and shows you the, the functional classes. So these would be corresponding to these ones, right? So these one, two, three, and four. So here's, and those are the WHO classes and what we consider starting patients on. So you can refer back to this as I talk about. I'm not going to ask a ton of questions on pulmonary hypertension, and I don't want you to be able to manage a pulmonary hypertension patient. So I won't give you like a clinical case that requires you to think about doing some kind of clinical optimization of a pulmonary hypertension patient. What I would like you to be able to do is recognize some of the medications used for pulmonary hypertension and understand some of the mechanisms of action. Uh, so a couple options we do. Um, calcium channel blockers have historically been used to start uh, patients on them, but as you can see, they aren't really recommended anymore. Um, you might see them used occasionally, but I kept them on here. Sometimes if somebody has tachycardia or they're bradycardic, they might start them on this. This might be a patient who has very mild mildly fits into like a class two, you might still start them on a CCB. But ultimately, first line therapy is going to fall on endothelin receptor antagonists and also um, some of our PD-5 inhibitors. And if you know these medications, you might know um, this is actually uh, Viagra and this is Cialis. So those uh, medications used for erectile dysfunction are also used in pulmonary hypertension. So let's talk about the um, endothelin receptor antagonists first couple different products on the market. Um, I gave you a few here. There's a few more that have come out. I think some of these are not available in the U.S. yet, but there are always new ones popping up here and there. Um, the more, generally speaking, they're getting a little bit more selective for um, the endothelian A receptor. Um, endo, the endothelian receptors are, um, by antagonizing them, you prevent chronic vasoconstriction and promote vasodilation within the pulmonary artery. And that helps it not to get stiff and rigid and um, cause that backup of fluid over time. Uh, but as far as differences go, um, again, there's not a huge one. Bocentin was the, the one that was on the market at first, and, and Ambrosentin is one of the newer ones. But again, there's some newer ones after Ambrosentin now, too. Uh, they are teratogens, and there's... Um, lots of recommendations in place for people using them who are of childbearing age. You actually have to prove that you are using two forms of contraception, have negative pregnancy tests and things like that. Adverse effects, peripheral edema, both setin, um, uh, required LFT monitoring. Amber setin doesn't have the same effects on the liver, which is nice. Flushing and palpitations. You might think about that as common for these things. So they're preventing vasoconstriction. So things that cause vaso, things that are responsible uh, or side effects responsible due to vasodilation, headache, flushing, think about that kind of stuff. Um, they're really expensive, like hundred, hundreds of dollars for a single dose or single pill. Um, Ambrosentin is also nice because it doesn't have as many SIP interactions. These medications often fall under orphan drug designation because this is such an odd disease. There's not a lot of money to be made in these. That's why they A, are super expensive when they do come to the market, and B, um, not very many pharmaceutical companies are actually bothering making them. PDE5 inhibitors, so again, these are medications used um, for uh, erectile dysfunction. The, the basic mechanism, we'll talk about these a lot more, but they increase intracellular cyclic GMP concentration, and it results in pulmonary vascular relaxation. What it does is it ultimately promotes the ability of the body to maximize its use of nitric oxide, which causes a vasodilation effect. Um, and it works in multiple places in the body. Phos phosphodiesterase enzymes are all over, and PDE5 inhibitors work in multiple areas as well. Um, the products actually were rebranded. Re so again, sildenafil is Viagra, but rebranded as Rivadio, and Tadalafil was rebranded as Adcirca. The purposes of that was to, um, I think, differentiate them. So somebody's like, oh, I'm taking Viagra. I'm picking up Viagra. No, I'm picking up Rivadio. It's a little bit you know, maybe less confusing to people when they're like, why are you taking Viagra every day, three times a day? It seems excessive. But, um, and just to give you a hint, like Tadalafil or Cialis for erectile dysfunction comes as five, tens, and 20 milligram tablets. Um, Add Circa is a 40 milligram tablet once a day. So it's a pretty big dose. And Sildenafil, you end up taking a fairly substantial amount over the course of a day as well compared to what you might take as needed for erectile dysfunction. So it's a relatively large amount of medication compared to what you'd take PRN. Um, side effects are similar to the uh, similar to the other drugs we just talked about, a little bit less, but you still get the headache and flushing. Sildenafil has some vision effects, light sensitivity associated with it, 
Tadalafil, some people report significant backaches and myalgias, um, but most people actually tolerate these medications quite well, especially for as needed um, for erectile dysfunction. Now, if you take them regularly with increased doses, that's where you're going to see some of these more substantial side effects flush out. Um, Tadalafil is renally adjusted, so you have to worry about that one for patients with renal issues. We'll talk about nitrates in a couple lectures here, but it is possibly contraindicated with those specific patients. Uh, the next class is prostacyclines. So these medications were some of the first ones developed for pulmonary hypertension, and they're actually, well, the, the most effective ones currently are continuous infusions, and they're designed to be given directly to the pulmonary artery. And I'll talk about that here in a second. But epoprostanol is Flolan or Velitri. There's a couple different brands of it out there. Um, and two different ways you can do this, IV infusion or continuous infusion or nebulization. Oh, I'll just throw this out there quickly. Sometimes if you work in cardiothoracic surgery, sometimes patients immediately after cardiothoracic surgery, so if they get like a cabbage or any type of valve replacement or something like that, um, they might have a temporary pulmonary hypertension like picture and so the way we treat that is by giving epoprostanol as a continuous infusion and that seems to mediate the symptoms while that heart's recovering from surgery and then ultimately they they should be able to be just fine after that so it's more of a temporary thing if you're using the nebulization if um, you're using an infusion that's more of an actual pulmonary hypertension so that's the difference here uh, half-life's really short um, so for a pulmonary hypertension patient if they're taking this so people get these pumps as an outpatient. Again, I'll show you a picture on the next slide. But if you're taking this regular, if you're taking this as an outpatient and your pump malfunctions or your pump runs out of medication, you've only got a few minutes before the drug's completely out of your system. And it can be a medical emergency. It can be life-threatening because you're used to having that. And if your pulmonary hypertension is severe enough, you could go into a really um, problematic heart failure exacerbation type picture where you get a lot of dyspnea fluid buildup on the lungs, things like that. Uh, Iloprost or Ventavis was a product that was designed to give this medication directly to the pulmonary vasculature. It was inhaled six to nine times daily while awake, so it was very inconvenient for patients, which is why it never really made it um, very far in the market, so people don't use that anymore. Traprostanil or remodulin is probably the more common one now. So again, people initially had Flolan as an option, and if that pump malfunction, you end up with a, a big issue, right? So triprostanol came out and it actually has a longer half-life of two to three hours. It's not refrigerated. Flolan, in addition to, to being a short half-life, was refrigerated. So here's a picture. This was actually a pump that um, had a cartridge of Flolan. So it was actually a pretty decent size. And then on top of that, you'd have to put it with ice packs when you'd carry it around with you. Remodulin can run on a much smaller pump, and it's much more concentrated, and the cartridge is very small. It just kind of clips into the bottom here. It's about the size of a of a you know an old school pager, more like a diabetic insulin pump in size. Whereas the the full end pumps are quite big. Um, this is a, a Hickman catheter, which is what a lot of pulmonary hypertension patients end up with. So it goes directly into the pulmonary artery and uh, infuses medication directly to the source. The nice thing about that is you avoid some of the systemic effects. If you're infusing remodulin throughout the whole body, and granted some of it is going to get around the body, you're going to um, get a lot more systemic um, hemodynamic uh, instability. Uh, this product also, besides being an IV infusion, uh, it does come as a sub-Q infusion, which um, has maybe some irritation, but if people can get around that, it's a nice option for people because you don't have to worry about like a central line infection, which is common with these types of products. So people who have a Hickman catheter and have to be very careful about their site and keeping it clean, uh, in addition to managing a really complicated medication regimen. So it's definitely, um, I put this comment down here, requires a really high functioning patient and extremely expensive. I'll just say that um, personally, my mom had pulmonary hypertension, which is why I'm spending a little bit more time on it maybe than the average person would. And um, very intelligent person, but uh, it's still a really complicated thing. You have to mix the medications at home. You have to uh, make sure you have enough supply. A lot of times you're going through specialty pharmacies and um, a lot of patients get a lot of, get some education to set all this stuff up themselves. But again, you have to be very on top of it. You have to use some minor compounding techniques at home and make sure your surfaces are sterilized and all that stuff where you can risk infection. So it is a, a more 
complicated process of administering medication than, than the average patient will be able to tolerate. And that's why it's not well, something we start patients on. So we're usually adding this to somebody in class three or certainly for class four. Okay, um, that's all I want to talk about. Again, for this, I'm not going to ask you where to classify patients or where to put people on medications. I want you to know um, prostacyclins and generally the names of them. So if I told you traprostanil and that traprostanil and epoprostanil are intravenous or um, sub-Q infusions versus like the uh, PDE5 inhibitors or our endothelian receptor antagonists being oral medications. And if you know that, if you got the basics of that done, you should just be fine. I only ask a couple of questions on pulmonary hypertension.